I've made quite a few videos about retro motorcycles and quite a few videos about classic motorcycles, but today the two worlds are coming together. In this video we're going to take a look at 10 of the most popular retro motorcycles available today, and we're going to be comparing them to their originals, the bikes that they are essentially emulating. I feel like this is all pretty self-explanatory, so yeah, let's just jump right in. Now this list would be nothing if we didn't include the most popular retro motorcycle in the world today, the Royal Enfield Interceptor. I wonder how many Interceptor owners know that this bike is based on a motorcycle of the same name from the same company, targeting the same markets essentially in the 1960s. I think a lot of people just think this bike sort of came out of nowhere, but it really didn't. The original Interceptor released by Royal Enfield in 1960 was essentially their biggest, fastest bike intended for the American market to compete with the likes of Triumph and BSA. British bikes were the fastest motorcycles on the road at that time, but Royal Enfield wasn't making fast enough bikes to really compete with the likes of companies like Triumph, and that's what this bike was meant to do. The original Interceptor was 700 cc's, but it was bumped up to 750 cc shortly after, so it's actually a fair amount bigger than the Interceptor that we have today. In terms of specs, the original Interceptor in, say, about 1965 was somewhere around 50 horsepower, so similar to the current retro Interceptor, which produces, I believe, 48 horsepower. I'm not seeing torque specs for the old Interceptor, but I would assume it's similar, probably a little bit less, and probably not produced quite as low in the rev range. Many of the bikes in this class, the new retro sort of classic looking bikes, aren't always producing as much power, and they usually do weigh a little bit less, but the torque is usually quite a bit more and quite a bit lower. In terms of the weight, the old Interceptor is slightly less. It's about 420 pounds wet versus the new one, which sits around 450 pounds wet. I think one of my favorite things about the look of the new Interceptor is how it really does take cues from that original bike, from the engine shape and just the overall design, the upswept exhaust, the shapes and like the color options. The chrome tank, for example, is something that was on the original Interceptor. I would guess most riders have never seen an original Interceptor. I hadn't seen one until relatively recently. Like I didn't know a lot about this uh, original Interceptor until not too long ago, but it's such a classic design that it works to copy. You know, people see the new Interceptor and they don't, you know, they don't need to know its history to know it's just a great looking bike. The Interceptor really stands out among many of the other retro bikes in that it looks and performs quite a lot like the original. And we'll see as we go through a lot of times retro bikes perform quite differently, but these bikes really are pretty comparable. Next up we have the retro Kawasaki W800 versus the original classic Kawasaki W1 from the 1960s. And remember, these really are motorcycles that are modeled after those original bikes. That's at least the intent. The W800 certainly looks a lot like a Bonneville, but that's in part because the original W1 was trying to look basically like a Bonneville or just look like a British bike. The current Kawasaki W800 is a 773cc air-cooled parallel twin, producing 48 horsepower and 46.3 foot-pounds of torque at 4800 RPM. The original W1, first sold in 1966 here in North America, produced slightly more horsepower, about 50, and slightly less torque at a higher RPM. Again, that's pretty consistent for classics versus originals, at least in this space. About 40.5 foot-pounds of torque at 5500 RPM for the original W1. Again, that's pretty common in terms of specs to see, you know, similar power to weight ratio, often because the newer retro bikes are heavier. And so in total, you know, they won't always produce a lot more horsepower. In this case, they can even sometimes produce less. And the new ones will weigh quite a bit more, but because of modern braking and frame design and just the way these engines are tuned for torque, they'll still feel quite a bit faster than the old bikes. For example, an original Honda CB125 from the 1970s actually produces quite a bit more power than the 125 Honda Grom, but I would wager that a Grom would beat that CB in almost any setting just because of all of the other factors. With the W800, it is a bit sad that this big of a bike that is in, you know, air-cooled parallel twin going up against a 50-year-old air-cooled 650cc twin, and it's actually less powerful than that original 650. I don't know. Sometimes, yeah. In terms of looks, the W800 doesn't take after its original in the same way many of these other bikes do. Again, I think it's made to look more like a Bonneville than the original W1, which, you know, sort of has a unique look. There have been quite a few paint schemes for the W650 and W800 over the years that point back to the originals, but the overall lines, the exhaust, headers, you know, the seat, tank shape, 
handlebars. Most of it doesn't really look that much like the W1 in my opinion. It looks more like a Bonneville. Regardless, both of these are really beautiful bikes, and I know the history behind Kawasaki and the W series originally basically being a Japanese-British bike. I still hold to that. Like, it really doesn't look that much like the W1. It looks way more like a Bonneville. And uh, it makes sense. You know, that's the look everybody wants. And it is a beautiful bike. You know, it's one of the most beautiful retro bikes you can get. But in terms of comparison, you know, the one thing to always think about is that the old bikes are always going to be going up in value for the most part. And the new bikes are never going to go up in value, at least not for like another 40 years. And even with going up in value, the originals are still going to be better investments. So another thing to think about. So this one's a bit less clear in terms of what the retro bike is tied to, but I do really think that the current Triumph Scrambler lineup is pointing back in Triumph's history to the original Scramblers, especially the TR6 of the late 50s and 60s. That's kind of like the original Scrambler bike, you know, in terms of production bikes. That motorcycle really was at least the first one to really gain popularity here in the United States. Essentially, that was a bike built for dirt and desert racing, but also built for the street in the mid-60s. That was the bike to have for high-performance off-road riding, the Triumph TR6. More than anything, though, it was cool, you know, like all scramblers should be. The thing to know when you compare old Triumphs and the current modern classic Triumphs is really how they're tuned. On paper, the 900cc liquid-cooled platform isn't really that much more powerful than the old Triumphs when you factor in weight, especially weight. I mean, they're significantly heavier than, for example, the old TR6 and the old Bonneville of the 60s. Those were like 380 pounds wet. The current 900cc Triumphs, like the Scrambler 900, weighs almost 500 pounds wet. So we're talking over a 100 pounds difference. And trust me, having ridden both modern classic Triumphs and classics, you feel that weight. You know, and that's even more so with the 1200 platform. But in terms of performance, the old Triumphs can realistically do, you know, 50-ish horsepower, whereas the 900cc new Triumphs do 65. And the biggest thing is the torque. The new Triumphs produce all of their power and all of their torque at incredibly low RPMs. They're tuned for torque. So think of them more like cruisers. They really are tuned to be sort of Harley beaters. Whereas the old Triumphs like the TR6 are much more revy and much more performance oriented, especially for their time. There's no doubt the new Triumphs are faster than the old ones, you know, but it's not as big of a difference as you might think. The biggest difference is the way that they perform and the way that they make their power. The Triumph 900cc platform doesn't really want to be revved out much. It, it just doesn't at all. You know, it just, it feels good in the low RPMs. Whereas my old Triumph, for example, feels really powerful when you start getting up into like five or 6,000 RPMs. The design is another discussion. I mean, it's hard to deny that Triumph has done a good job of emulating the old style. The Scrambler really does look like an old TR6. The tank shape, the overall lines, you know, these new retro Triumphs are really modern versions of the old bikes, you know, they look very similar, but there's little bits that are more modern. The seat covers, you know, the use of things like brushed aluminum and Triumphs really got a great eye for design. You know, you, you just can't deny that. And as much as I love old Triumphs quite a bit more, my head still turns every time I see a Bonneville or like a Scrambler. If I actually needed to go scrambling though, I might want to take the old TR6 just because it's so much lighter, but you know, you are going to feel the old suspension and the braking especially. So the performance might lend you to want the new Scrambler more, but if you're just going to go cruise around town on a cool looking Scrambler, ah, I feel like you gotta go with the TR6. That's just my opinion. All right, next up we have the new retro Honda Monkey versus the original Honda Z50 or Honda Mini Trail. Many of you have noticed that Honda is bringing back lots of small bikes from its history. There's the Super Cub now, the Trail 125, and of course the Monkey, and also the Dax is coming back. The comparisons to these older models is essentially the same, especially with the Monkey and the Dax. I mean, the original versions of these bikes were 50cc platforms, and then of course with the Dax, it was more like, you know, 70 and 90 with the CT 70 and 90, but the new versions are really on-road, on-the-street bikes with more powerful engines and more speed. They're just kind of made to look like those little off-roaders that so many old dudes started riding on. In the case of the Monkey, we have the 125cc single from the Grom and the Cub with the traditional clutch. It's got the five-speed gearbox, whereas the original Z50, like the one that I have, going all the way up through 1999 was a 50cc single, usually with a semi-automatic three-speed transmission, though there were some variants. The early Z50s were essentially kids' bikes, you know, but they were made to be ridden by anyone. They're tiny, but they're still accessible for adults with high bars and really 
a comfortable setup. But with just 50 cc's, I mean, you're only looking at about two horsepower, whereas the current Monkey produces about nine and a half horsepower. The design is really key for Honda. The Monkey really toes the line between being retro inspired and actually classic. You know, the Bonnevilles are really more classic. They look pretty much like the old versions. They're essentially designed copies for the most part. Whereas a bike like a Z900 that we'll look at in a little bit, that's more retro inspired. And the Monkey isn't quite a copy. It's just more inspired by the original Monkeys. It doesn't have the high handlebars of the early mini trails, but it also doesn't look exactly like the later mini trails that utilized rear suspension. It's kind of a mix of all the mini trails throughout the years. It has the big cushy seat, you know, the paint schemes really do harken back to the early hardtail years, but then that upswept exhaust that's sort of exposed looks a lot more like the early softtail minis of like the second generation. If you want a true classic that you can just bop around on and have fun and maybe teach your kids how to ride with, you're obviously not gonna wanna get a new monkey. You know, you can't teach your kids how to ride on that probably until they're quite a bit older. The original mini trails are a fantastic bike for that. That four stroke, single cylinder 50cc is so much less intimidating than many two-stroke options for kids that are out there today. They truly are indestructible little bikes. I've made a few videos on the Z50 in the history if you want to check that out, but if you want a proper motorcycle that you can actually go places on, obviously you can't get a Z50, you know, you should just get the new Monkey. But yeah, both really cool bikes. Next up we have the new Royal Enfield Meteor 350 versus the original Royal Enfield Super Meteor. Now the Super Meteor was again, like the Interceptor, a US inspired motorcycle just prior to the Interceptor. This was a 692cc twin, first released all the way back in 1952, and this really was the precursor to the Interceptor of the 60s. In many ways, Royal Enfield is just pulling this name out of their history for their new bike. These bikes have very little in common. They really have nothing in common. The old Meteor was a high performance twin from Royal Enfield, whereas the new Meteor utilizes their 350cc single cylinder platform. And this is a bike, you know, that would probably lose to the original. This is one of the few bikes that really would be slower, even with the bad brakes of the old Super Meteor and the bad suspension. I mean, I'm putting just about any bike up against that 350cc platform from Royal Enfield. It's slow, it's heavy, you know, but that's all good. It's okay. You know, it's not a bad thing. That's what that bike is meant to be. The new Meteor is essentially a cruiser, like it's like a little baby cruiser. And in terms of the overall look and design, it does in some ways harken back to the British bikes of pre-1960. You, you know, you can see the difference between the old Meteor and the old Interceptor, as well as many of the Triumphs pre-1960. They kind of look more like cruisers. They have that World War II look. Bikes really hadn't taken on that flat, upright position, and the new Meteor does look a bit like the Super Meteor in that regard. But otherwise, the design is really quite different. Obviously, the engine configuration isn't even the same. We're talking about a single versus a twin. And so, not a lot in common. Very different options for probably different people, and I'm sure a lot of you aren't going out to probably buy a Super Meteor anytime soon as they're pretty rare. Uh, but yeah, I thought it'd be interesting to show the differences. These two bikes don't have a ton in common. Number five on our list goes to the Triumph Speed Twin. Now, in many ways, this too is just a name sort of being pulled out of a company's history, but I actually do think the spirit is there. See, Triumph has this lineup of retro parallel twins. We call them the modern classic lineup, and the Speed Twin is the second most performance-oriented version of that lineup. But the original Speed Twin, well, that was, you know, Triumph's first foray into making a parallel twin in 1937, the iconic parallel twin that really did pave the way for motorcycling going forward. Every parallel twin since then owes something to that original Edward Turner design for Triumph. But I think between the two Speed Twins, the Spirit really is the same. Lightweight, fast, nimble, fun riding. That's what the Speed Twin is currently, and that certainly was what the Speed Twin was back in, you know, 1937 when it was released. Comparing specs is almost unfair. We're talking about 80 plus years difference. That original Speed Twin produced about 27 horsepower and weighed close to what the Bonnevilles of the 60s weighed, probably about 380 pounds wet. The new Speed Twin produces just under 100 horsepower and weighs about 480 wet. So this really is, in my opinion, one of the coolest bikes that Triumph has in their retro lineup. It's one of the lightest modern classics you can get. It weighs less than a Street Twin. For me, the Speed Twin has always been the bike to get from this lineup because it really retains that performance-oriented element that the old Triumphs had. A Speed Twin can hang with most street bikes in its segment while looking about four and a half times cooler. 
In terms of design, there actually is a really great video by Motobob comparing the original Speed Twin with the new one that I'll link below. That's a really interesting video, and it's cool to see the differences. But anyways, there's a similar red paint scheme harkening back. Otherwise, not a lot in common between these two bikes. Number four, we have the Honda Super Cub, the current retro-inspired Super Cub versus really the Super Cub of multiple decades. Now this is tough because the Super Cub originally took on many different forms and sizes from the original 50cc version to later 70 and 90cc versions. This really is one of the most true to form retro bikes on the list though. The single cylinder current Honda platform really is the evolution of that original single that powered not only the Cubs but also the mini trails. This is still that air cooled, simple, dead reliable engine. It's a pretty much the same thing. The current Cub looks almost identical to the original Cub besides, you know, more modern touches like the gauges and the grips, but it's little things, you know, the overall look of the bike to an untrained eye. A lot of people see these, I think, and think they're old Super Cubs. Obviously, you've got updated brakes and suspension. Plus, the current 125cc engine is going to have quite a bit more juice than the original 50 and 70 and 90cc platforms. The new Cub also retains the semi-automatic transmission. Though many of the original Cubs used a 3-speed gearbox, there was also 4-speeds just like the new Retro Cub. And Honda really has figured something out with these Retros. You know, they're affordable bikes, they look classic, they look like the originals. People love them for that reason. They're easy to use just like the originals. They look very similar, in this case almost identical to the original bike. But they're modern in all the right places, much like the Interceptor. Versus many of the other bikes on this list, you know, like the Bonnevilles, those are more premium bikes and they come at a premium price. Whereas this is just a really cool looking, awesome, reliable bike that is super classic. And so I think this is a great bike. I think obviously the old Cubs are awesome, but this is a really cool retro version. Number three goes to the Moto Guzzi V7, which was recently updated to an 850cc engine capacity producing competitive horsepower with the likes of Triumph's 900cc engines. Versus the original 1964 Moto Guzzi V7, that was a 700cc transverse V-twin, producing 40 horsepower and weighing in at around 500 pounds. Pretty hefty for those numbers when you consider a Bonneville produced about the same or more horsepower at the time and weighed under 400 pounds wet. In 69, a V7 Special was released, producing 45 horsepower. This motorcycle would evolve quite a bit over the next few decades, spawning iconic bikes like the Ambassador, which would produce just over 60 horsepower, but was quite a bit larger and more of a cruiser. The current V7 really harkens back to those originals, and in terms of performance, it's not really close the way some of these other retro bikes are. The 2022 V7 makes 64 horsepower and weighs about 480 pounds wet, which really isn't bad compared to the other bikes in this class, whether it's the 900cc Bonnevilles or the Kawasaki W8. If it weren't for Moto Guzzi's lack of support here in the States and in so many other places, I think that these bikes could be super popular because they have a ton of character, they're probably better looking than almost anything else for retro bikes, and performance-wise, they really are comparable to the best. The design is consistent with the originals, they're just beautiful bikes. One of my favorite modern, sort of classic bikes in terms of looks, and, you know, they really blow the old ones out of the water in terms of performance. Next up, we have the Kawasaki Z900 RS versus the original Kawasaki Z1, also a 900cc inline four. Now that original bike was first released in 72 as a direct competitor with the likes of Honda CB750. It's interesting, my dad always tells stories of this bike in the 70s and he knew a couple guys who had these and they were the fastest production motorcycles available. Nobody on any bike, whether it was a Sportster or a CB750 or even a lot of two strokes could really hang with this bike in the quarter mile. Now this original Z1 made about 82 horsepower, which is really fast in 1972, and it weighed somewhere around 550 pounds wet. So a big, fast, hefty motorcycle for its day, kind of like the Hayabusa of its day, or like the H2. And man, they're beautiful. And sadly, they're skyrocketing in price. So if you have the money, you know, they're definitely a good investment and you can find them for reasonable, but a really nice mint one could push $20,000. The current Kawasaki Z900 RS is basically Kawasaki's inline 4 Z900 in retro clothes, and I have to say, it's done well. You know, this is such a cool looking bike with true modern performance for less money than a lot of retro bikes. I mean, it's competitive with, you know, most of the Bonnevilles and, you know, a lot of other bikes that are a lot less performance oriented. 
You can grab one of these for just a smidge more than the W800 from Kawasaki. Okay, it's a few thousand more, but this is real modern sport performance. 109 horsepower at 470 pounds wet. This thing is faster than the Speed Twin on paper, and it costs less. Also, 72 foot-pounds of torque, so really good specs. I do think that I would personally take the Speed Twin, just because I think it's going to produce more character, but if you really want a modern performing smooth bike, that looks the retro part that has an awesome history back to the old Z1. This is a great option. It's not an exact copy of the old Z1, but it retains many of the lines and the paint scheme sort of harken back to the original bike. And it really is the evolution of that sort of iconic inline four platform from Kawasaki. I think that someday, maybe even 15, 20 years from now, because these are pretty rare, these bikes could definitely go up in value. Last on our list, the BSA Gold Star, and this really is an interesting one. This bike technically isn't released yet, but I'm sure many of you know about it from its debut in different shows. But before we talk about the new one, let's look at the original BSA Gold Star. I'd like to do a full video about the Gold Star because it's such an interesting, cool British bike with such a cool history. The original Goldie was basically a race bike for the road, a record-breaking 500cc single-cylinder engine. I mean, when set up correctly, these bikes can't even idle. Like, they can't hold an idle. <laughs> Talk about a bike for enthusiasts. I mean, kind of difficult to ride, and they're very just difficult to start. They're true enthusiast bikes. But if you were around in the early 60s or late 50s and you wanted to have the baddest bike on the planet, you had to have a Gold Star, especially in Great Britain. For me, the generation of the Gold Star that the new one is really looking back to in terms of design would probably be, I don't know, the late 50s or the early 60s models. So let's say something like a 59 Gold Star, which would produce about 42 horsepower at 7,000 RPM. These really were high revving singles for their day. They liked to rev and they weighed about 420 pounds wet. The new BSA Gold Star 650, also a single cylinder engine, but it's liquid cooled, sort of made to look air cooled. Anyways, it's projected to do about 45 horsepower at 6,000 RPMs, so really not far off just in terms of power, but of course, modern brakes and modern suspension and a modern frame. It's tough to compare in terms of performance, but the spirit is really what isn't there for this bike and for many other retro bikes. You know, I think my biggest frustration with companies just sort of buying old company names like BSA and pulling out their most legendary names essentially for profits, let's be real. And then to make what is essentially a beginner bike for today, I don't know, it just feels weird. I've made this comparison before, but the idea of, say, Ducati dying in five years, which obviously isn't going to happen, but let's say it did, and then 40, 45 years later, maybe even more, someone buys the Ducati name and whips out, you know, a beginner bike and makes it look like a Panigale or a Desmo Sedici or something or a 916. And I don't know, I just find that a bit offensive. <laughs> I wasn't around in the 50s and 60s and I've never ridden a Gold Star. Uh, but I'm sure those of you who have, maybe you're into the new BSA and you want to buy one. But I think there's also a group of people who see it and just don't like it. Because we're talking about, you know, one of the fastest, coolest, baddest motorcycles in the world for its time. And this is just a bike made to look like that old bike. I, I don't know, I don't love it. I mean, in terms of design, they really have stuck to the original look, which I do think is cool. It's not as streamlined, obviously, and it does kind of just look like an Interceptor, or it does just at least look like something Royal Enfield would release. No retro bike can be as streamlined as the originals because they all have bigger gas tanks. There's so many more electronics. Emissions stuff always makes it difficult with the exhaust, though some companies can hide it well. Also being liquid cooled, you have to find a place for the radiator and BSA so far hasn't done a really good job with that. But you know, it's a solid attempt. Maybe the production version will look even better, but I do have to applaud them for making a pretty cool looking bike. Personally, I'd much rather have an original Gold Star, even with the headache of starting it and dealing with riding them. But you know, that's just me. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video comparing new retro bikes with the original classic bikes that they're trying to sort of emulate and look like. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Make sure to subscribe if you liked it. We'll see you guys in the next one. Ride safe.